You can access the entire episode now on our website, ForbiddenKnowledge.news, Rockfin, Rumble, and all podcast platforms. That's very interesting, and I've had many people that I have discussions with that say, man, this has changed in my reality completely. I don't remember this being this way. I don't remember this being this color. I don't remember this person acting this way. It seems like we are having these strange dimensional shifts based on the collective experiences that we're having. It seems to be pointing to the probability that we are infinite creators with our imagination. The energy and ideas that we put out there then manifest into something tangible and physical that we can experience. I think there's very much something to that, especially on a collective level. When we look at Hollywood, why else would there, why else would it be so important to control the media? You know, it's a manifestation machine in large part and consensus reality definitely has an effect on how we live. If we didn't believe in fiat currency, we wouldn't be using Mm. it, you know, and on and on. I could go much, much further on, but I think, you know, that is the power of the spell of, um, of, of much media, right? It's to, it's to, it's to put an idea into the public consciousness and make it so strong and overwhelming that everyone just buys that and i think what's cool about the time that we live in now is that and it's a bit of a two-edged sword i guess but so much we can see because of the internet and learn and understand you know much more about our own nature uh the nature of men the nature of women uh how how people act and interact and, and and what these patterns uh are that we can start to take note of and make predictions based on the future and a lot of the things that we've been taught about reality could not be further from how reality actually works so it's a pretty amazing time to be alive i want to go back to a second to the possibility that you were saying that we have infinite probabilities and possibilities and universes and anything is possible and i was having really a moral dilemma at at one point a few years ago and i was using magic mushrooms, plant medicines, to try and come to terms with a situation that I needed to make right and fix. And where I was stuck was my belief that there was only one way to fix it. And this was pumped in through years of programming that there are certain things you can only do one way. And it was through this profound psychedelic experience that I realized, you know what, there's infinite ways to do it. And I not only figured out a better, different way to do it, I figured out like 12 different ways to do it in the same experience. And that's such a beautiful thing that we don't have to be stuck and bound by the belief that there's only one singular way to achieve something. Yeah, I love that. You know, the author splits us up and a lot of this stuff in reality transferring, I'll just preface yeah. this entire episode with this is that these are the ideas that are running through every other esoteric book. They're not really any different. It's just his angle and perception vocabulary and the way that he describes things are different. And just so happened to come to me at the perfect time too, you know, but, um, but basically we're two part beings, we're heart and mind and our heart or subconscious mind is connected to everything that is. It's directly connected to infinity and the, all those possibilities. Meanwhile, our mind is very, very uh, static here in the material realm. So the mind tries its best to figure out how we're going to get from A to B. And very often, that's exactly what gets in our way. You know, you're like, oh, there's got to be, the, I've got to do this thing this one way and I'm going to do A and that's going to lead to B and then C is going to happen and then D and we've created this sort of mouse trap in our head, like the old game where it's like, oh, this thing will go in the bucket and then this thing will fly over. It's like, no, no, just focus on the goal and take action. Don't worry about the how because your heart connects to what he calls outer intention. And this is the closest thing to magic. Mm. Uh, being defined as you could as you could call and what outer intention is really looking for is it's looking for a win-win 
So it's, it's like, I can give this thing, it benefits me, but it also benefits other people, right? Whereas inner intention is very much the mind, like I'm gonna get what's mine and I don't care who gets in my way. And so we often fight and fight and fight. And what we find is that because the world really mirrors us, the more we fight against the world, the more the world is like, fine, I'll fight you. <laughs> yes. You wanna fight? Let's do, let's do it. And we're not gonna win that fight. Wow. <laughs> I mean, you know, but those are sort of the two forces that he's talking about in the book, the outer intention or the sort of magical force that's connected to us at the heart level. Uh, and then this idea of inner intention, which is egoic action. He doesn't really use the word ego in the book, but it's really, that's really exactly what it is. And so in order to really find our goal and meet it in the most efficient manner, we want to use nature and able to do that. And nature follows the path of least resistance or less resistance, right? It's going to find a very simple way. And so a big part of the book is the idea that we can take complicated problems and find simple solutions to them. And in fact, normally there are, and as you just demonstrated, there may be quite <laughs> a few different solutions, which is a, a, an amazing thing, an amazing thing to keep in mind because it's so easy to get our blinders on and kind of get stuck in this tunnel vision. And it's very difficult to solve problems that way, especially in a creative. For me, it was really difficult because I grew up in a Catholic, very religious household, went to church every Sunday and was programmed to believe that you had to do this based on the word of the Bible, the word of God. If you did it any other way, you're going to hell and there's no deviations. And it's unfortunate that there's still a lot of people who are stuck in that paradigm. And that is what religion had to offer us is a prison basically for our mind. Yeah, uh, religion is really, really good at doing that. And, and to be fair, any system mm -hmm. is. Any system itself is a system of control. So another one of the key takeaways from this book is this idea that he calls energetic pendulums or energetic informational structures or destructive pendulums. And he uses the word pendulums. Uh, you might know the, de the term egregore yeah. is a very similar idea, right? So not all egregores are pendulums, but all or I should, I should, let me say that correctly. Yeah, not all egregores are pendulums, or not all pendulums are egregores, but all egregores are pendulums. And what a pendulum is, is whenever two or more people get together, there is a created energy that comes from that. So any group, uh, whether it be the state, the government, a corporation, whatever, a culture sort of is created as a result of that, that being formed. And so if you don't conform to whatever has been established by this energetic structure, right? Like it's more than just the organization that we create. And it's not necessarily that all pendulums are bad, but all pendulums do have the potential to be destructive. So if I go to the gym too much, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like I join a volleyball league or whatever, you know, that can become an obsession. It can put me out of balance completely. And then ultimately what's happening is, is I'm giving away my own power and individuality to this other thing, this pendulum. So think about a football game, you know, everybody goes in the stadium, they're yelling and shouting and they're wearing their red or black or whatever the color of the team is. That is a pendulum in action. The same is true with the church uh, and so on. And so this particular phenomenon, I mean, huge takeaway, huge insight, truth drop right here, because you start to see how you are influenced by these entities, I guess you could call it, right? Like in the book, it doesn't necessarily say this is a demon or whatever. It's just like, here's a collection of energy and here's what happens with collections of mm -hmm. energy. And these collections of energy are all competing for our attention in order to hook us into their reality and then make us serve them. They, they feed on our energy. Right, it could be the archons, right? Like, you know, there's a there's a lot of people that talk about this particular phenomenon, but the way that he describes it as an energetic informational structure that basically contains all that energy. And when we give our individuality over to it, our thoughts, our mind, we start to think the same as all the people who are part of that. We start to act the same, we start to conform. And the rule of the pendulum is do as I do. Right, like you're a Mormon, put on a white sleeveless shirt, put your placard on, get on your bike, let's go. 